So hold on. We we con uh, begin soon. to discuss uh, the COVID World Health Assembly, as we are calling. We are just waiting for one panelist to join us, uh, but we will have three panelists to discuss this topic. Um, ah. Let's just hold on. I think she's done. So good evening for those who are in this portion of the globe and good morning for the folks that like me are in the west part of this planet that is in turmoil in the face of this serious pandemic. Uh, thank you very much for joining this webinar. I am Mayra Matias uh, and will be your host today I'm speaking direct from Brazil, where I am editor of a journalism project called Outra Saúde, that translates in English uh, means Another Health, and is founded by Medical International. Today, we will discuss and analyze what we are calling the COVID World Health Assembly, uh, this debate is organized by People's Health Movement, Free Continental Institute, and Geneva Global Health Hub. Today, we will be talking in English, but to democratize the discussion made here as much as possible, the organization of the webinar has provided translation into the following languages. Spanish, French, Arabic, and Indy. To listen to the translation, all you have to do is click in an icon in your Zoom screen that says interpretation. Then you choose your language and there is no icon for Arab. So please choose Korean instead. And also for Indy, you have to choose the Chinese icon. I must remind that uh, the audience plays a major role in this webinar. So please send your questions through the key and a option below your screen because we are going to have a debate after the presentations. Before we start, I would like to remind key messages and issues that were highlighted in the press before the WAJ, including the hype around the inquiry on China. In early April, Trump accused WHO of being mishandling the pandemic and being China-centric and announced that US would freeze founding of the organization. Later, Trump and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo started to claim that the high voltage transmission called a spillover event occurred in a lab in Wuhan that researchers bad coronaviruses. Australia led the way in calling for an investigation on China, suggesting that it would raise the issue at the WHA. But this investigation on China was nothing more than a smoke screen. Other important issue discussed in the media before the assembly was the Costa Rica proposal of a intellectual property for COVID-19. What did happen 
is a resolution on the COVID response that was passed unanimously. And we will hear more about it from the speakers. So to discuss the COVID World Health Assembly, we count on the assessments of three speakers. The first one is Dr. Walai Pong Pachiara Narumo. She is with the Ministry of Public Health in Thailand and will share her reflections on the assembly and explain to us what were the discussions that took place in preparation of this WHA regarding the negotiations for the resolution on the COVID response. Then we will have Dr. Sunda Raraman, also known as Sander. Uh, he is global coordinator of the People's Health Movement. He will locate the assembly within the context of the recent attacks on the WHO, as well as share key points of PHM's assessment of the resolution. Finally, we will listen to Natalie Rhodes. She is with the People's Health Movement group in the United Kingdom and followed closely the assembly as part of the WHO watch team. She will share with us the PHM's perspective on what is required to facilitate her access to medical products and technologies in the context of this pandemic. And we'll also comment on the resolution. That said, we will hear Dr. Wallet on she is the Director of International Health Policy Program and Director of Global Health Division of the Ministry of Public Health in Thailand. A pharmacist by training, her main research areas include health financing, universal health coverage, health systems, health policy, and global health. Good afternoon. Can I have um, my slides? Will the IT uh, person share the slide on screen or I need to share myself? Can you hear me properly? I think I need to share my PowerPoint on my screen. Okay, someone uh, is sharing. Um, good afternoon again. Uh, this PowerPoint uh, is uh, jointly um, made by my colleagues, uh, especially uh, Dr. Sweet, who supervised me and introduced me to you. Uh, could you go to the next slide? Or otherwise I can share my screen. Could you stop sharing and then I can share my screen myself? Sure. Thank you. This slide show you the previous World Health Assembly, which was held in with the substantive agenda, whereby the 73rd World Health Assembly was held only two days. 
It is the first ever to be held virtually. This is due to COVID-19 pandemic. It will resume again later in 2020. The first plenary meeting was with the high level welcome remarks, including head of state from six countries, including China, German, France, South Korea, Barbados, and South Africa. For the agenda, it was like only the opening of the Health Assembly and then go to the address by DG as well as the draft resolution proposed by EU and other co-sponsors, followed by the invite speakers and then executive board election and closing of the Health Assembly. The highlight in red box is the supplementary document. I will show you later the supplementary item which related to Taiwan. For the blue box, it is on special procedure which the resume the BHA was proposed in this special procedure. This slide um, show you the purpose of supplementary agenda item. You can see on the screen, it is inviting Taiwan to participate in the World Health Assembly as an observer. So the Secretariat proposed that this proposal will be submitted to the General Committee for its consideration. It means that it won't consider in this assembly, whereby the president of the World Health Assembly this time proposed that it will be submitted to the general committee at the resume session, which will be decided by the EB on this Friday. From this slide, you can see 14 member states propose the agenda of Taiwan, which is which made the China unhappy. This become another dispute of member state at this WHA. For the EU proposal for the draft resolution of the COVID response, finally, there are many countries become the co-sponsor of this draft resolution. This is only one technical agenda item discussed at this WHA. This slide show you only the Operative paragraph number nine request the director general to initiate at the earliest appropriate moment for what? For stepwise process of impartial, independent, and comprehensive evaluation of the situation of the COVID 19. I highlight this because this slide show four critical points of the resolution. First point is on global priority for fair distribution of all essential health technology to deal with COVID pandemic. The second point is on the relevant international treaties that should be harvested where needed. The third point is on vaccine. Vaccine should be classified as a global public goods. The fourth point is on R&D, which should be promoted for public and private to jointly work together. That resolution 
was only one substantive agenda item to be discussed at this virtual WHA. DG Tedros had his closing remark and he highlighted one important which related to the resolution. I highlight it here that he thanks the member state for adopting the resolution. And the resolution called for independent and comprehensive evaluation of the international response. So uh, his closing remarks mention again on the independent and comprehensive evaluation. This point was mentioned by the president Xi Jinping from China at the beginning that he came to deliver welcome speech. At the end, also there are several head of state and the government, for example, from Colombia, Paraguay, Bhutan, Vietnam, etc., to come to join the World Health Assembly. Maybe the uh, this WHA had many head of state than ever to join the World Health Assembly. From our reflection, our minister delivered his speech during the World Health Assembly. And he pointed out clearly that we are at the war against COVID-19. On his fourth point, he mentioned clearly that we need collective movement and we must quarantine politicizing COVID-19 to ensure solidarity. You can listen to his speech or read his statement on the website of WHA. It was posted on the website. Unfortunately, this World Health Assembly did have many battlefield at the World Health Assembly, but it was not the battlefield for fighting COVID-19. But it is the politics in global health, I could say. The battlefield number one is on an observer in the WHA. You saw it already on the document of the supplementary agenda inviting Taiwan to participate in the World Health Assembly by 14 member states. USA and Taiwan allies by the um, many member states made statement clearly supporting Taiwan. Subsequently, China voiced its serious concern that it violates UNGA resolution on one China policy. Together, the other member states, for example, Pakistan and Syria, openly endorsed one China policy and reaffirmed that there is only one true representative of China. This made the WHA 73rd become hot and hot during the night of 18 May. Another battlefield is on US and the WHO. This slide show you the statement made by the US Sec uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services. He mentioned about the WHO failure on the core function of the WHO and urged that this must be not happen. The status quo at this moment is intolerated by the US and he urged the WHO to be changed. 
the third battlefield is on Russia and Ukraine, as well as Russia and Georgia. This happened after Russian Federation is elected as a member of the WHO Executive Board. Ukraine and Georgia raised the issue of Russian occupied territory in these two member states. The fourth battlefield is on unilateral sanctions. Cuba, Iran, and Syria made the statement to protest unilateral sanctions imposed by the US. The US delegate replied that its sanction had not affected the COVID-19 related assistance. In summary, the virtual World Health Assembly 73rd had both advantages and disadvantages. For example, it could make delegates the physical distancing and to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. It also reduced expense of the WHO and the country. Also reduced air travels carbon footprint. However, there are several limitations during the two days World Health Assembly. First thing first is the different time zone around the world. So many uh, interruption by technical and internet limitation. Many times the secretariat call for delegates of member states to deliver his or her speech, but delegates was not there. Another key point is that the secretariat failed to control two minutes slot for member states to deliver statement. Some member states took more than four or five minutes without controlling by the secretariat. This point could be improved. But I would like to come to the last slide of the summary. WHA, the 73rd World Assembly Abridge is not intellectual stimulation in my point of view. It is because it becomes political debate using the COVID-19 as an entry point to dispute between member states on their interests. This WHA already changed in global health the U.S. president did not show up, whereby China pressed at the beginning. The virtual meeting of the WHA has neither spirit nor solidarity for collectively fight against COVID-19 because they dispute on politics. The substantive agenda item of the World Assembly will, will be at the resumed session at the end of 2020, including an observer uh, by Taiwan at the WHA. I foresee that it will be the hot issue during the World Assembly at the end of this year. But this is a good tactic for the WHO Secretariat because the election of uh, the US President will be held at the end of this year. Let's see what it will go. Thank you for your attention on the presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Valaipun. This was highly informative. Uh, it's always interesting to have a glimpse to what's happening on the backstage. Uh, now we will hear Dr. Sander, uh, who is currently the global coordinator of People's Health Movement. He's one of the founder of members 
and national conveners, an acti activist of the Indian chapter of PHM since its inception in the year 2000. He trained as physician, provided technical support to the National Rural Health Mission, and was dean of a school of health system studies. So Dr. Sander will give us the PHM's perspective about the assembly and the resolution. You have the floor, doctor. Thank you, uh, Maria. And thank you, Valaipon. You gave us a sense of almost as if we had attended the uh, World Health Assembly. You were able to give us a good sense of what was happening there. A lot of what I am saying now is in the People's Health Movement commentary. We have something called the WHO Tracker, which is, you must visit it in the website, which is always there. And it helps build a public understanding of health policy and is a tool of our intervention in global health governance. And this is a lot built upon how we develop that. Now, the big thing about the, if I have to find something positive to say about this COVID World Health Assembly, the big thing I would say was that there was a consensus at all. Everybody, there was an unanimous adoption of the resolution. The US had some four dissociations with four paragraphs. But eventually, to put 194 nations together on such a contentious uh, resolution and come out with a consensus was quite a feat. So I think we must start with appreciating that. And there have been a number of clauses that affirmed the role of the WHO and its leadership role, which was also under threat and therefore was also a welcome move as people who are interested in multilateralism and democratic functioning at the international level. There is certainly a blow for that. And I think the third, though this may not be very well realized to the outsider is the way that the TRIPS flexibility is sort of managed to make it into the resolution. People who've been following the discussions, there was an April 29th version, there was a May 4th version, there was a May 6th version, a May 8th version, a May 12th, and then a May 18th. And you could see... That's having difficulty goes okay. through. So that, that you could see that the TRIPS flexibilities are something that... Uh, uh, was almost left out of the early versions. So therefore, it sort of made in, into the resolution, but just. But on the flip side, there is so much left wanting in this resolution. The emphasis is all about what the WHO secretariat should have done. It just underplays the role of the member states and at some point, the WHO is actually of the member states. It's an organization, a general body of the member states, and the WHO has its role. And there is a definite issue that the preparedness of the international health regulations, the health system's preparedness, the reason for the poor response at many levels were at some point, the challenges there were not really uh, focused on. Part of the reason was the two big distractions and misrepresentations on the call for a probe. One was the call for a probe into the virus source, and the other was about the role of the WHO itself. So the media had projected China as cornered on these two points. And it distracted, and very often what people have heard about this assembly is just these two. What was finally adopted was not an anti-China call, but a professionally negotiated position which all nations, including China, signed on. As the People's Health Movement, this paragraph 9.6, where the WHO is called on to work with other organizations to identify the zoonotic source of the virus and the route of introduction to the human population, including the possible role of intermediate hosts, which will enable targeted interventions and the research agenda to reduce the risk of similar events. And goes on to say, prevent the establishment of new zoonotic reservoirs and new emergence of zoonotic diseases. 
that was the brief. It was not, not really about just whether what happened in Wuhan. And that's important. And at some point, the PHM would have actually, people's movement would have liked it, stated much more upfront, not only limiting to the immediate link, but also to the larger ecological relationships and the nature of commercializations that take place in agriculture and primary production and how all these are affecting. Because certainly for most of us in this generation, to those whom it is the first pandemic, they are saying it's not going to be the last. There have been many pandemics in the last century and sad to say they are occurring with increased frequency. And therefore, this is a meaningful thing for us to really explore this particular thing. And it's good that the uh, resolution has highlighted that, but it needs to go further. The other was on the role of WHO. Donald Trump had already stoked the fires with his threat to defund well, well before the WHO assembly. And he added to it by a particularly incendiary letter that he sends off on May 18th, just on the day, which threatens to make the defunding permanent if WHO did not agree to completely unspecified, non-transparent set of demands within 30 days. It's just an ultimatum that he issues. In 30 days, you do this or we get out of this. But having said that, such geopolitics is not new to World Health Organization. It's always been a terrain. Dr. Sander, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I, can you please put uh, your headset so we can? I don't, this, I'm not too sure that that will work on this, but I can try that. I'm not too sure that. Is the sound coming through poorly? Uh, it would be better if, with the headset. I'm not sure that's the problem, but maybe an overall, is it better now? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, early on, in 1949 to 52, for example, 56, for example, the Soviet Union was out. In 1973, only China came in and that time replaced Taiwan, something that we are revisiting now, but that was, which was the Chinese policy. In 1977, the list of essential medicines followed by 78, the Alma Ata declaration, and then the breast milk, substitution, breast milk substitutes resolution, all of it angered the corporates so much and the U.S. so much that in 1985, the U.S. seized all funding, uh, it um, uh, froze its funding to the World Health Organization. So this is an old story. This is a fight that has been going on for quite some time. And in the 1990s, the World Health Organization was marginalized. It comes, makes a comeback, but it has to actually compromise. It has all that time balancing between the priorities of its funding sources, which are now bilateral and tied in the main, and the priorities of it as a global health organization, which has a public health duty to perform. And therefore, this unequal power play between this has always characterized WHO. So Donald Trump is maybe angry with it for one reason, but we from the people's movement are angry with it from the other reason. And we have no common ground with what is the anger of the U.S. But what is the anger of the U.S.? So at some point, the, uh, what is new in the U.S. is its behavior like this in the middle of a pandemic. So despite this, despite its stated position, the U.S. actually enters into very serious negotiations in the resolution, so it didn't stay out of it. And after it had got a diluted resolution passed, it disassociated, disassociated itself from four paragraphs. Two of them, para 7.5 and 9.4, were on sexual and reproductive health. 
the us has a stated policy where it will not support abortion in any form and it sees the slogan of sexual and reproductive health as something that defends abortion and therefore it negates it but the other thing was on paras from 482 to and 4 Eight two and nine eight, which were on all on access to essential medicines and technologies. Now, my next speaker is going to cover that. I am not going to go into it, except to say that this was actually what the game was really about. The rest were all distractions. And at some point, as this new huge market opens up for medicines, PPEs, and vaccines. The U.S. believes historically that its technology will give it the advantage in the market. And it may be for, again, counting wrong on that. China may was very clear. It made an offer of $2 billion coming in where U.S. was backing off and a debt relief to the African nations. And then to add to it and what must have really hurt the American cause was that he was willing to, the Chinese president offered to put this vaccine as a global public good on the market and that would have really been hurting so there's a whole geopolitics that is going on and if this trump was the bad cop in the scene the tough negotiator in the scene the polarizer in the scheme the european union resolution is best seen as the good cop which in the core issues was as much in favor of the corporate positions as the US only wanted to do it in a much softer way through negotiation, through compromise positions on that, through a push for voluntary licensing so that you don't fall back into compulsory so that you close the group for something that defends the intellectual property rights and compulsory licensing. So it was a negotiated position, did not want it to go as they lost the Doha declaration round. So in some sense, the European Union resolution is in essence what the American corporate were after also, except that it was negotiated much better. But somewhere, and I'm going to leave the part about the medicines for Natalie to pick up. I'm going to say, what did the people's movements expect, expect from this? Should we define ourselves by the framework that the European Union has set in league with some point with the American and the industrialized world? Or what are our concerns with it? What bothers us in this whole resolution is the lack of enough emphasis given to what the member states should have done, especially the policies, practices, and experiences in the whole control of the pandemic. Now, one must recognize something about the WHO. The WHO cannot verify data independently. It does not have the powers to do so. The WHO cannot enforce a decision. It is not, cannot apply sanctions, for example. They cannot even declare an emergency on their own. That power has also been subscribed by an emergency committee because at one point they were too worried that the WHO's declarations could be premature and could affect trade and tourism. And therefore, even that is not an independent action of the director general. So when the powers, the accountability and the finances don't go together, we need to actually see at one level how much you hold them accountable for, but also what you need to empower them to do that. Could they at least have mechanisms of data verification? Could they, how do they exercise due diligence? Are there data standards that can be followed? Are there emergency advisory powers where he can advise without going into the committee? There has to be a whole area of review that this whole resolution fails to touch on. And the obligations, not only with respect to the pandemic, but also the UN mandate of safeguarding human rights and access to the entire range of healthcare and social security needs. All this are not really being done justice to. So, what I would like to really criticize this resolution for even condemn it, I would say, is for its silences. The draft is silent on the needs of migrant workers, on refugees and stateless people. 
while it lauds health workers it understates the conditions of work of health workers and other frontline workers especially in the third world situations it does not empower the dg with the authority and finances so that in cooperation with concerned un agencies it can launch on scale humanitarian relief where there are large concentrations of refugees or stateless or even in lmics which are unable to actually cope with this tension on this we also would the draft is and coming from india and coming from the developing world silent on lockdowns the whole draft is really gives a skip to this so all of us who live in the developing world in the global south covid 19 is an image of being haunted by migrant labor on the march millions of hungry starving desperate families exhausted as they walk hundreds of kilometer under a blazing sun braving police brutality facing high levels of stigmatization and a considerable denial of health care and all human rights failure in this resolution to even acknowledge this while discussing it is a serious serious problem of this resolution the phm therefore calls for a review of lockdown strategies across countries and contexts to understand how effective proportionate or humane these restrictions were and how the benefits weighed against loss of lives and suffering due to other health conditions and due to hunger starvation loss of livelihoods loss of freedoms and exposure to violence including domestic violence that such lockdowns led to in most low and middle income nations if the first and foremost rationale for lockdowns is health systems preparedness then the commitment to reach and maintain a level of health systems preparedness that makes such future restrictions less essential and more selective must become a global commitment on that this whole op that para 8.1 does call for health system strengthening but makes no reference to their assisting in establishing what is called ihr core capacity yet the international health regulations which is a binding treaty only one of two such treaties that the who has which is therefore got force in law it has a global commitment to identify investigate associate and respond to public health events so the national capacities to do this must be built up but where is it built up most nations have failed to have this capacity in the face of a pandemic so if i would actually worry about what the who did not do i would worry about the fact that it did not give warning about the lack of health systems preparedness and i would much more worry about member nations having failed to keep this commitment and the reason why they failed to keep this commitment is because this core capacity is intrinsically intrinsically tied to health system strengthening it's not vaccines alone that needs to be made a public good it is all of public health systems that must be explicitly recognized as a global public health good and a global good because a outbreak in one nation threatens all nations today after decades of structural adjustment reforms and privatization of health care the public systems as exist in many lmics are minimally designed systems that deal only with residual care the taking care of only those diseases and those patients which are not attractive to private markets but such systems are most incapable of dealing with the pandemic unable to deal with it and suddenly threaten the lockdown is no longer a brief supplement to public health action but becomes a substitute for it so i think at some point this whole issue of when you talk of mutual accountability there are no references to state accountability for acting in a spirit of unity and solidarity and we are not really calling when we talk of accountability for member states accountability to the who secretary we are really calling for a who uh, for the member states accountability to its own people that is what is enjoined in the ihr treaty to strengthen such accountability in the case of covid 
would require impartial, independent, and comparative evaluation of country performance, including that of the US, so that we can be assured that the necessary lessons are learned. There is also a need to go into the human rights abuses of this period, the loss of democratic rights, the undermining of labor laws, and the increase of political persecution. The entire UN system must respond to this. There is every reason to believe that uh, there are many nations which have more which have been more humane and respectful of people's rights, have not necessarily done worse. In fact, many of them have done better in terms of the care that they have provided for their citizens. So finally, I close by saying that while PHM appreciates the call for sustainable funding for WHO, this call is weakened by the lack of any reference to the freeze on what is called assessed contributions or to the need for flexibility of funding that WHO requires, rather than the donor chokehold over the WHO's effective budget. The weaknesses of the WHO stem from having to negotiate the priorities and directions of its donors and the use and its allies in the main, with the priorities that a professional and public understanding and a political understanding of health and public health would set. Yes, the WHO needs to be reformed, and yes, its response to the pandemic was far from adequate. But the direction of change is not the direction which Trump would have it move. Rather, it would move on a corporate, free of corporate influence and in a pro people direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sander, for this analysis that does not. Let us be deceived by stories about bad and good cops, and also don't let us forget what is at stake. Uh, finally, I will pass the baton to Natalie Brooks. She was conducted research into buyers' clubs and their role in achieving equitable access to medicines. She now works on issues of corruption in health, access to medicines, and is a member of the UK working group of PHM. Natalie, please share with us the specifics about the resolution's approach on the access to technologies prompt. Thank you. Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen, just bear with me. Is that fine? Can you see the screen okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, yes. So thanks for the introduction and thank you so much to the other speakers as well, gave him a very good sort of introduction before I start as well, sort of the bigger picture of what happened this week at the World Health Assembly, what were the big issues, and now I'm going to go into a little bit more detail around access to medicines. So I'm going to look at what do we need to achieve equitable access to COVID medical, medical products? And then what did we actually get in the resolution? This is just some um, headlines recently from newspapers that you've probably seen um, about issues in access to medical products, for example, around PPE and testing um, and treatment as well. So these are some of the key issues. So even before we've got a verified vaccine or treatment, we're already seeing these issues of access of medical products. And then this, I just put this in here as well, just as sort of a reference, I'm not really gonna go so detailed into it but it's just to sort of paint the picture also to remind us all when we're talking about access to medical products, it's bigger, it's not just the licensing, so it's not just the patents, it's not just sharing of research and development know-how, it's not just about pricing, it's this whole life cycle and we're already seeing issues along every single step, whether that's low research quality and sort of the modern day piracy between countries of sort of outbidding each other for masks on runways, um, and substandard products as well, and prioritisation, these sort of nationalistic policies that we're already seeing. 
And just to, as a sort of a, a refresh before we go so much into it, to talk about what is this issue when we're talking about innovation and intellectual property and public health. So at this intersection, what are the issues that we have, generally speaking? So the argument for intellectual property is that it would protect companies' innovations and ensure that the investment they make when they're researching and developing new treatments, vaccines, etc., is that this needs to be recouped. So this innovation, this needs to be protected by the intellectual property so they can have a monopoly and ensure they can get, recoup their costs. And this is required to provide an incentive for pharmaceutical companies so they can meet the public health needs. So that's sort of the story. And unfortunately, this isn't the case. So what actually happens is the intellectual property it provides companies with market monopolies, meaning that they're the only source of treatments or vaccines. And so there's no competition. So that means they can set the price they wish. And if a government can't afford to buy that vaccine or that treatment to meet the population needs, then it just means it won't be accessible and they won't be able to provide it for people. So instead, when companies are talking about innovation, they don't have people's health in mind, they've got their profits in mind. What's the next blockbuster medicine that we're gonna get? What, how can we maximize profits? It's not how can we maximize our contribution to public health as much as they would argue it, that's the case. Okay, so then to move on, so what did we need in this resolution? What were we looking for? What were we hoping for? And did we get it? So I'm just gonna go into a little bit more detail on each of these five points. So firstly, this is pretty self-explanatory. Vaccines must be viewed as a global public good. And it's more than just semantics. A global public good is a good which can benefit all people in all countries. So by saying that a vaccine is a global public good, it means it must be able to benefit everyone. So it must be accessible for everyone. So it's an important statement. And D linkage, so sort of ramping up in the conceptual details here, going from something quite simple, this can seem a bit abstract, but hopefully it can sort of make sense. Um, so D linkage, it's basically, it's a model, it's a concept. It was put forward um, by Jamie Love and Tim Hubbard in 2004, so about 16 years ago. And the idea is that D, as I mentioned before, it's that financial incentives that drive drug development. How can we make the profits, not how can we meet public health needs? So one proposal is then let's break that sort of incentive, let's break that chain as helpfully visualised there. So if we want development of new medicines, then we shouldn't rely on the money and the profits that are made from intellectual property rights, essentially. So we need to de-link those costs. So what could that actually look like? Because I know that can sound a bit abstract. So one example is this could be a prize fund. So you let's say, for example, now in this context, so all countries could be asked to contribute an equitable percentage of their GDP. So a certain percentage of their GDP. So relatively, all countries make a fair contribution. And then this creates a pool, a prize fund. So then when a company is able to produce a, an effective and a safe vaccine, for example, then instead of being awarded through intellectual property rights and the monopoly and those derived profits, instead they'll get awarded with this prize. So it removes this argument that they need this high price, they need this monopoly to protect their investment and get that re cost back because instead this fund would give the cost back and then it would allow this vaccine to be um, license free so then it could be manufactured by different companies around the world and actually reach and be available and be accessible but it's still sort of a concept and it's been around quite a while but we still need more exploration so we really wanted to see that in the resolution and that to be sort of a mandate of the WHO to explore this and provide some more information to member states on how can we get this into action. The next round, um, benefit sharing. So there needs to be both knowledge and benefit sharing. So 
of the benefits that come out of genetic resources. Um, so this is quite a specific, so it's fine if you're not familiar with it, but there's the Nagoya Protocol on the biological diversity. Um, and don't need to know the details, but essentially that Nagoya Protocol, it provides a legal framework for the effective implementation of fair and equitable sharing of benefits that arrive out of genetic resources. So to put that in sort of the COVID context, if we had this language, if we had such a legal framework, such principles in this resolution, then any technology, any benefits that come out of the COVID genome, for example, a vaccine, which uses the COVID genetic sequence to be manufactured, then the benefit that vaccine has to be equi equitably shared. So this is a tool that's, that can be used to leverage access and it provides a legal commitment. So we really wanted to see something like that, something much stronger. And then the ACT Accelerator. So the ACT Accelerator, it was, in case you missed it, it was um, announced by the WHO and other co-sponsors the end of April. And it's, it stands for Advancing COVID Technology. It's basically sort of, I've added an image there, hopefully you can sort of see it or get the gist of it. Um, it's basically this proposal of collaborations, for example, the G20, WHO, World Bank, and forming these different partnerships under vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics, and health systems, these sort of multi-sectoral partnerships. And the goal of the ACT Accelerator is to develop safe vaccines, tests, therapeutics at speed and scale that we need to make them accessible and affordable in an equitable way for everyone around the world. So that's the goal. But this ACT Accelerator, as it is in this framework, it's not fit for purpose. So it essentially it won't be able to achieve that goal. Um, and another, and I'll sort of, there's lots of reasons why I'll try and give like a quick overview of why that is the case. Um, so firstly, it marginalises the WHO. So that's sort of what we've been talking as well already on this webinar. So as you can see, if you try and look for WHO, it's just one of the, it's just a player, one player in this another multi-stakeholder partnership. But that's not what we need. We need a framework that affirms and it strengthens and it respects the key role, this preeminent role that the WHO should play in international health. So when we're having a framework like this, something that's in global health, we already have the perfect actor, the person, the person, the body that should be leading this, and that's the WHO. So why are we not strengthening that? Why is that being marginalised? Next is serious conflicts of interest, risks of conflicts of interest in this framework. So um, if you read, so European Commission, they put this went up and there's all the sort of a QA and a on our website so you can read sort of what the details are, proposed details. And any donor, they can not only can they direct their donation to, I should mention as well, so this was then linked to the global coronavirus response if you saw that was a big pledging conference uh, organized by the European Commission and it raised eight billion dollars um, so that's sort of the money that I'm referring to here these donations so the donor could give that donation it could choose which pillar it wanted to go to and not only that it can choose exactly which partner it wants to go to with sort of no oversight of how they make that decision or then how that money is spent there's just asked for some reporting to this facilitation group you see above but there's no clarity of will there be any management conflicts of interest in there. So a donor could specifically, for example, give that donation to a pharmaceutical company. And although the wording, so it says um, that this funding is meant to be accompanied by commitments from donors in support of global access, but I mean, what does that mean? It doesn't really give any detail of how it's actually, what does this commitment look like? Um, and the commitment that we need to see is that a pharmaceutical company, and they explicitly said they don't have to do this, this in the Q&A, they don't have to forego their intellectual property rights or the monopoly. So without having that commitment and without requiring them, how are we going to achieve equitable access if we're saying to pharmaceutical companies, you can still keep your IP 
it just sort of contradicts the whole goal of this framework. And additionally, it lacks accountability as well. So it sort of has this facilitation group, but it's sort of really wishy-washy how the reporting is this reporting, but it seems very, well, it says these different partnerships are meant to run as autonomously as they can. So we're sort of, who is actually going to have this oversight over this? Okay, then the last thing then I'll touch on is around TRIPS flexibilities. So they've already come up um, and TRIPS flexibilities and TRIPS, it's won't go into too much detail exactly what it is, but it's an international trade agreement between all the member states led by WTO. Um, and we often refer to this and we push and we call for full utilisation of the TRIPS flexibilities. And I just, within that, I want to make the distinction between these two different licensing types because perhaps particularly recently, if you've heard about voluntary pools, voluntary licensing, so you have that, but it's not as strong that we, we want compulsory licensing. And I'm gonna sort of explain why. So if you compare and look at the first bullet points of both, so voluntary licensing, it's granted by the manufacturer. So this is the patent. So um, when the company, they have the patent, they have this license, and then they can grant this license to other manufacturers, to other companies. So voluntary licenses, the power is in the manufacturer's hand, the power is in the pharma company's hand, and they decide which countries they give it to and which other manufacturers they give it to and they allow to produce this drug. But they still keep their patent, they still have their patent and they can keep it in other countries. And the compulsory license, this is granted by a government. So already this is totally different power dynamics in both different scenarios. So a compulsory license granted by government. So if they decide they have the need and they need to um, grant a compulsory license, then they don't need the permission of the originator, of the patent owner of that pharmaceutical company. They can decide as a government, we are issuing a compulsory license and they can issue it to um, companies in their country or they can just allow them to import from companies from outside the country. And in return, they have to pay an adequate remuneration, um, some fees, some like royalty fee to that company, but that's decided on a case by case. Um, so this is definitely the stronger option, but we're seeing sort of this focus on voluntary licensing. Um, and I just wanted to, take it a step further, exemplify this a little bit more, looking at the recent case of Gilead and Remdesivir. So start of next week, so start of last week, um, Gilead, so you've probably heard about Remdesivir um, in the news, a potential treatment for COVID. So this is a drug of Gilead, the pharmaceutical company who also, um, you might have heard them if you know much about hep C, the treatment. So Gilead, this was, they made billions of hep C, you know, so they've, they're a, they've had these blockbuster drugs before and they've been quite strong in their um, intellectual property and it's prevented access before in other issues like pretty severely. So with this, um, so Gilead, they granted voluntary licensing for 127 countries, which at the face of like, okay, great, 127 countries, but they only granted this to five companies. So this is, how can just five companies be able to provide enough of this treatment for 127 countries and of course it's only 127 countries so which countries aren't in there often it's upper middle income countries that are sort of missed off these things um, and additionally with this agreement it's often take it or leave it terms and conditions so it's the farm company that have the power and there was no negotiation here so they said to these grantees, this is the agreement, take it or leave it. And it, there's not really, at least to my knowledge, there's, no, there's been no transparency either of that agreement. So we don't really know what are the actual terms and conditions in that, what has to be met. Um, and this actually, it allows them to have this voluntary license. So then you can be like, wow, if Gilead, they've had this voluntary license and they're promoting access in 127 countries. But I mean, what about all the rest of the countries? So they still, they're still gonna have their patent there. They'll still have the monopoly in the other countries who will have no choice but to pay the prices that that company sets. So we don't know how this is going to go. Um, so we'll just have to see, but this is 
yeah, so the issue. So really, really push for compulsory licensing. When we're talking about full trips flexibilities, not just voluntary, but also especially compulsory. So Ben, what did we actually get at the resolution? Um, no, I see my formatting has gone a bit off. Okay, but I feel like you get the the idea. So vaccines as we did, okay, in the resolution there was good language, so it was of equitable access. Um, but that's sort of where the positives end, sadly. Because, so you could say with this resolution, its heart was in the right place. You know, it had good intentions, it set out with equitable access, but without having the correct tools and levers in place, then that's all it's going to be, the good intention. So for one, a vaccine was not declared as a public good, but immunisation was declared as a public good, which is just a paradox. It doesn't make sense. So immunisation is that process, you know, of a vaccine being administered to someone. So how can you have that process and recognise that as a global public good, that all people should benefit from it in all countries, yet you don't declare the vaccine, the actual thing that is being used and injected as a public good. It doesn't make sense. You can't have one and the other. So it's a bit useless, sadly. Um, Delinkage, again, that wasn't included in now, though that's been established and, you know, it's been other, for example, the UN high level panel meeting access to medicines, there were submissions on there. There's some very high profile actors who have supported this model, but still it wasn't included. No reference to benefit sharing. The Act Accelerator, that was in there without sort of any changes or any references to sort of weaknesses. Um, and, but the thing is the very fact that it was in this resolution, it just, um it adds sort of strength it legitimizes this act accelerator as it is and it says this is good enough as it is and it supports it so it says it's okay and it's legitimizing the role of the who again the sidelines legitimizing this in the end the central role that farmer will have okay it's a more just they called a partnership but who who are the people with the power when it comes to drug development we know it's pharmaceutical companies and then finally with trip flexibilities so trips flexibilities it did say full use of trips flexibilities in the language but then it specified voluntary pooling and voluntary licensing and not specifically compulsory licensing so then to finish off this is the last slide i sort of wanted us all to sort of take a, a step back because i know i've really gone into such minute detail there um and i think sometimes at least myself when i'm talking about this topic you can sort of lose the what are we actually talking about here um and what is the injustice that we have so the injustice is and what makes so many people so angry that we feel passionate enough to be talking about these trade agreements and licenses and you know legal frameworks which i can understand from the outside probably seem quite dry concepts yeah it's a topic that gets people really passionate and the reason is because at the center at the core of this is that people should not unnecessarily die in order to protect pharmaceutical companies innovations and their profits so when you're justifying high prices medicines they have to be pride you know they have to be high pharmaceutical companies they have to recoup their costs even though it's sort of we know as well they don't actually spend as much on R&D as they do when they spend things on paying their shareholders but we won't go into that so when you're justifying the high prices you're, essentially you're saying it's fine that this happens and it's just an unfortunate side effect that millions of people die because they don't have access because we have to protect this innovation and we have to protect the patent system and we have to protect investment and that's the injustice here and that's what's wrong and that's what we mustn't forget um, and the issues that i've raised and the advocacy points and things that we're pushing for it's nothing new these issues are nothing new the issues of accessibility and affordability and people dying around the world because they don't have access, they're not new. The symptoms of the broken system, a system is broken. And, you know, you just have to look back 
for example, the development of antiretrovirals, HIV treatment. And from the time that HIV treatments, the ALVs were available, so they were actually, they existed and we knew that they worked, until the point they were actually accessible for everyone in all countries, 10 million people died in that time. The drugs existed, but the reason they weren't accessible is because pharmaceutical companies were protecting their investment and they were protecting their patent rights. And the impact of that, it wasn't, it's human impact. It's people that will die. And I think that's something that we really need to remember when we're talking about these like specific sort of dry details. What is the reason that we're pushing for this? Why is it? And that's why. Um, and, you know, just think with the system, how has that changed? And have we even got better in the past 20 years? So we have to ask the question. So if we can't fix this system now in the way that it's broken now, and we're during a global pandemic, then when can we? Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, we will jump to the debate now. Uh, there are many questions about the whole and the crisis of WHO, so I will start with that. Uh, I will first ask, uh, ask Dr. Volaporn uh, a question that was, was sent uh, and says, as far as I know, WHO don't have the power to monitor the health preparedness. Uh, Sorry, uh, I will start again. As far as I know, WHO don't have the power to monitor the health preparedness of any country. Do you think that giving WHO the power to visit any country and evaluate the health situation of country would change anything at the global level or improve global health? Thank you for the question. As we know that we have IHR, International Health Regulation 2005. Also, we agree on JEE, Joint Evaluation, Joint External Evaluation. That could be one platform for further work and Doctor, further sorry, sorry to interrupt. I'm so sorry. But I will ask the speakers to keep their video on so everyone can, can see our face. You can continue. Yeah, okay. Um, I repeat it again. Uh, we, we have a IHR, International Health Regulation, and also we have JEE, the Joint External Evaluation. At this moment, uh, WHO already uh, established a mechanism for supporting a country to uh, do the um, JEE of the IHR. This is the, the fundamental platform which could uh, strengthen preparedness and response. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, now I'll ask Dr. Sander. Uh, what is your take on a situation where the U.S. freezes funding? Will it not affect the goodwill of assessed contributions and encourage voluntary contributions for it to go on with business? We don't have too much to say about what the U.S. does, but potentially other nations will have to step in. And in fact, the U.S. will commit only if it is uh, sort of worried that other nations will step in and make them redundant. It still doesn't prevent them from completely walking out like they have done in UNESCO, they have done in some other organizations, which they can. Here, the problem is that if you heed the U.S. and if you concede their major demands, then the WHO is going to be hamstrung from fulfilling its basic objectives. It's not going to get very far there. 
so this negotiation both sides have to give way and at some point i think that only way forward is for who to persist with the support of the other nations and to the extent that we can mobilize uh, support from uh, middle income low middle income countries saying that the who is your shield you need it there and you can look at the larger things you will have a better chance of getting the us on board we certainly can't give in to the us it's not going to help further but i mean the who is weak on that it's not necessarily willing to stand up to the us because there are bureaucrats there there are salaries there at some point the amount of courage that they need to show is not been very much it's surprising that a who which is not known for its boldness and stuff stepping up as being subject to such uh, uh, such harassment is what i can see and that that's point of time yeah thank you very much uh now to natalie a uh, question uh, about what is the ideal way to distribute the new vaccine to poor nations uh, which cannot contribute financially to the research and development um sorry could you just repeat the first part of the uh, what is the ideal way to distribute the new vaccine to poor nations which can not contribute financially mm -hmm. to the research and development so a few of the sort of details that i went through there are tools that can sort of be used so for example with compulsory licensing so if or better yet okay let's say there's no patent so that means that other can other companies can make this vaccine for example and you can make you can call it we use like the term generic which is basically like no brand um, and so then it can just be produced at cost and then this can be distributed to countries um, but there's lots of different pricing models as well um, and there's some good papers that came out on at the outcome of the fair pricing forum there's articles sort of on the BMJ if you want to read them and there's different graphs so for example if you think like a low-income country middle-income country high-income country and that's sort of their ability to pay and if a price that a medicine needs to be sold at in order to recoup their, their costs just the costs is here then that means that high-income countries can still pay their ability to pay because then this will offset countries who don't or who aren't able to pay that sort of higher cost. So that's one way as well. Um, and so there's lots of different tools such as that. Yeah. So it's all about sort of what is the fair price. I think that's one key way. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, Dr. Sander would uh, like to jump in in this question too. Yeah. So one of the things that I'd like to point out is that a lot of the research is actually being done for COVID-19 with public funds. They are government funds. They are not the funds that the company is putting up. And one of the old solutions has been to de-link the pricing of the research from the pricing of manufacture. So what you really need is to be able to transfer technologies so that the vaccines can be manufactured at every point but the cost including a certain price that has gone into the research can be reimbursed by any set of arrangements and you would find that a lot of it is not actually put up by the pharma a whole lot of uh, the, the genome on which they are basing the vaccine is actually being researched by others and given to them okay and for many of these other things also the, many inputs have come from other sources so that the you dealing the cost of the research and don't put let the price of the vaccine bear that cost and you can actually work out different things but you need transfer of technology therefore the chinese offer is extremely interesting that it can actually not only it's not a question of manufacturing and exporting i don't know whether they are clear on that but it is a question of being able to transfer technology so that it can be manufactured at multiple sites that's what we should really go for the research can be reimbursed, so to speak. Cool. 
Uh, I will continue with this topic uh, because we have a question about the pharma multinationals. And if uh, I will pose th this question to Dr. Wallapone uh, that followed the assembly. Uh, and the question is, were the pharma companies lobbying in the run-up of WHA in order to protect their privileges? Or are they keeping a low profile at the moment, relying on the US and other Western governments to defend their interests? Malena, I cannot hear you properly on which question. I will repeat the question. Uh, were the pharma companies lobbying in the run-up of the WHA in order to protect their privileges? Or are they keeping a low profile at the moment, relying on US and other countries to defend their interests? Actually, the pharma the would lobby um, the country anyway. But for the lobbying at the WHA, I think uh, each member state need to protect uh, their own interest, not led by any pharmaceutical uh, company. Okay, doctor, uh, now we have a lot of questions about the US uh, whole in this pandemic and the crisis. Uh, so I will ask Dr. Sandra uh, to comment on what did you think about the demands for the US? Should they be heated to? If they are heated to in one way or another, will they not further politize the WHO and undermine its severity further? It's, it's a difficult thing. There are two things. Uh, I did answer this earlier in saying that the WHO cannot heed it without uh, losing, compromising itself as an organization for public health. They would do not do justice. They can't do. They have reached a point when they have to choose between doing justice to the cause of public health and doing heeding the U.S. But the other flip side of it is what a um, lot of what the U.S. is doing is actually designed for its domestic states. They are really playing for the next elections, transferring the blame, making a, a thing and the, also struggling to show itself as the superpower when actually they have relatively done very poorly on the pandemic control and their economy has taken a hit. So there is a whole uh, uh, theatrics which is being built up. Now one can hope that if there is an electoral change, I mean, can't know what happens in that, but if we have a change, then the US may not pursue uh, desperate policy. Because I don't think it is in the U.S. interest to step out of WHO. It is not. Even within their narrow corporate sphere interest, it has worked for them. But this is a position which is of the Republican right and within that a certain position which is... Thing. So we don't know. But my guess is they will not go all the way. But you can't... With this current leadership, you can't be too sure about that. We have seen him go all the way even when it hurts the U.S. Thank you. Uh, Natalie, uh, speaking of lots of opportunities, uh, I would like you to, to speak a little bit about the Costa Rica pool, uh, if, you, if you can. Yep, so I guess just for background, so with the Costa Rica pool, um, Costa Rica, they submitted a proposal to the WHO to suggest a pool of patents around COVID technology, specifically around vaccine. So it uses a model that already exists, the uh, medicines patent pool. Um, and this is an initiative and led by different organizations 
um, and it's been around quite a few years and normally it just covers HIV, AIDS and malaria um, and, they, and TB and basically it's a pool where companies, it's a voluntary licensing pool essentially, so they give up their, um, their IP rights into this pool and then this pool they then sort of have this mandate to grant this license to different companies to different companies around the world to promote access it's actually affordable prices and locally produced so this idea of the costa rica covid pool is essentially an extension of that so it got put forward by costa rica a couple of months ago um, and then last week last friday i think it was this got announced and it's supported by the who and it's now open and it's going to be the official launch of it yeah it'll be on the i think the 26th so it's um next week and so they're still looking for countries to be co-sponsors of it so i know for sure chile is um and then yeah so it's still under negotiation so at least myself so i've not seen what the framework will be and how it will actually be managed but hopefully seeing as it's the WHO leading it, hopefully it will be them that have the mandate and they can will have the oversight in order to allow all countries to facilitate that access to it. So hopefully it would be a good thing, but it needs to be like an addition. But we need all these other things. It's not just it's like a band-aid, but it's a good band-aid. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, our time has run out, but I I have uh, one last question that I will pose to all speakers and that it is the resolution isn't enough uh, some national responses are very disturbing and I know that because I'm <laughs> speaking to you uh, from Brazil so you must imagine uh, and I personally regret that even in the face of the worst pandemic in generations, the loopholes and gaps in the system are still exquisitely uh, big, very big. So I would like to ask each of you uh, what this pandemic teaches from the political economy perspective. Uh, we can begin with the with Dr. Uh, we can begin, begin with Dr. Wallaporn. On the point of a uh, political economy, I think we need a leadership which uh, take into account health of the population before the other thing. For the case of Thailand, we compile all the leadership at all level, not only at the national level, but also the leadership of the local government unit, including the village health volunteer as well. Everyone should collectively work together and then we should um, fight with the COVID-19. Dr. Sander. Um, you know, this COVID-19 is exacerbating a lot of fault lines within our society divisions of class, divisions of caste and community. There is this perpetual fear of the other, the migrant bringing in It's always us who have to be protected against them. Yet at some point, it is also showing that there is a need for a state, for the uh, role of a government that can rise above these divisions and be able to retreat ever more than before the requirement of solidarity. Because at some point, unless we are able to cater to this, and solidarity as opposed to market forces, as opposed to the fact that you are not, none of the problems that have been given rise to are being addressed by market mechanisms. All of them are requiring a state. 
and a state that requires to rise above these tensions and to be much more democratic than is required. But the, the tensions within society are such that they pull it in other ways. So there is a potential that you can get a solidarity out of it. But at this point of time, it is still the autocratic. It is actually uh, pushing towards more uh, of the police state and autocracies. And we need to know how we are going to authoritarianism also on the rise. So we are in a difficult situation. But the big point is also that the pandemic has not played out. I don't think that we are even reach the peak of the pandemic. The worst may still be to come. And therefore, it is very necessary that we start thinking about what we do in this coming year uh, and not only about uh, you know a post thing. We are still in the current phase of handling it. Thank you. Thank you. Natalie? Yeah. Um... Well, I think, as always, the issues of access to medicines and topics that I've spoken about is always overpowered by politics and economics. Um, and, yeah, just as points that Sundra has raised, that this is the same thing. It's sort of exacerbating these cracks. And what we're seeing is not really surprising. Um, but, you know, we have seen, in terms of statements, some strong statements. Uh, so, for example, from China, it declared that a, the Chinese vaccine would be a global public good which is good in strong language, um, also saw that, you know, different member states are interventions declaring that a vaccine has to be accessible for all. So sort of on the face of it, it seems like the political will is there, you know, the heart's in the right place, but it's not strong enough in terms of the tools to actually get there. And unsurprisingly, you know, you see countries, for example, US and Switzerland, who have a lot of pharma, um, and particularly in the US, a lot of pharma lobbying as well, they're always sort of against these things. So you sort of see the same things, um, you know, they're dissociated from elements of a resolution around its flexibilities. And in the negotiations, it was US who won a member states very strongly against the vaccine being a global public good. So yeah, as always, when it comes to these things, you've just seen the overpowering the politics and the sort of even the governments, you know, and they should be answering to people, not to the farmer. Um, and you see sort of how these power dynamics come out to play. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank, in fact, all the speakers for sharing their analysis with us today. Uh, People Have Movement, the Tree Continental Institute, and the Geneva Global Health Hub for organizing this webinar and for you that is still with us and watched and participated in this debate uh, thank you very much this webinar may and sorry <laughs> thank you very much for the interpreters uh, that made possible to democratize as much uh, as possible this debate see you